Okay, I want to get through lesson 14 and part of 15 tonight. So this lesson is a huge lesson. I don't want to just race through, but we're going to have to track as we're going. And um, this is a huge, huge lesson. And I'm going to put, put the cat out of the bag a little bit. As we were sharing the truth now amongst the Mangan, we actually had people coming to repentance and faith in the Deliverer and began to be transformed from this, less, this lesson onward. It is that huge. Like God doesn't put in empty lessons in the truth of his word. And so I love this lesson. It's a huge, huge one. So number 14, Cain and Abel. God is faithful to his word and casting all sinners out of his presence to suffer the results of their choice. Number two, God will accept us if we come by the one way that he provides, repentance and faith. Number three, God, uh, God graciously calls sinners to repentance and faith, desiring to rescue, but he allows, he allows you to choose. So in these lessons are difficult to listen to because the bad news just seems to come in wave after wave after wave. How could our ancestors, Adam and Eve, throw all of God's goodness back in the face? Look at, what, look at the mess that they've made. As we, look at the, as we look at the disaster that they've created for us, it's like we've been handed a personal death sentence. It's almost like God has thrown, the, thrown us into the cell and slammed the door. It's almost that, that severe. But God adds one more important piece that is necessary for each to have a relationship with him. So take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. This, this kind of ties together and ties the, the previous lesson back to this one. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 48. Okay, everybody got it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. This is a huge, huge verse. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So if any of us hopes to be accepted by God, then what is required? Perfection. Perfection to what standard? His standard, so notice, notice the words, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God in his holiness is the mark. If we want to have a relationship with him, then we have to be as absolutely perfect as he is. But look at our, look at our state here. Look at where we're at before God. Look, we're cut off from God. We're controlled by sin. Look at this record. Is there anything that we can do to meet that mark? Do we have any hope within us in order, as Matthew says, be holy as my Father is holy? Can we do anything? We're helplessly and hopelessly lost. And in order to have a relationship with God, then what has to happen to this record against us? What needs to happen to every line, every item on this list? What needs to happen to it? It needs to be wiped out as if it never existed. If we intend to have a relationship with God, and so let's go into this lesson today, the lesson on Cain and Abel, the descendants of Adam and Eve, and uh, let's look at it and see what God has for us because there's some important truths. So number one, God is faithful to his word and casting all sinners out of his presence to suffer the results of their choice. So take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three, verses 22 and 23. Can somebody read that for me, please? And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Okay, so who's God talking to in these verses? Who's God talking to? The man... Um, what's it say there? And then the Lord said, behold, the Lord said, who's he talking to? To himself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? Because they're the offended party. They're the ones that are standing as in judgment of Adam and Eve. They alone can make that statement. So when Adam and Eve were first created, they waited on God to tell them what was right or wrong in every decision. But that all changed as a result of their sin. As a result of their sin, they became like God, knowing good and evil, but now they also experienced evil within them. Now they were in bondage to it in every thought, every attitude, every word and deed. They were cut off from God. So why do you think God would not allow them to eat of the tree of life? What was the big deal? Why couldn't he allow them to reach out and, and eat of the tree of life? 
They would stay in their sinful state because what did God proclaim about them in their sin? What's the payment for their sin? Death and death, separation from him for how long? Forever where? On earth? Knowing the place of torment. So as a result of that, that's no longer longer an option. But remember, why did God put the tree of life there in the garden in the first place? What What was the significance and importance about it? Remember, back to lesson seven. Why did God put the tree of life there? choice yes but if they ate of the tree of life what would they be demonstrating trust in god but more than just trust in god that tree also portrayed to adam if he chose to eat of it he would be humbling himself and saying god you are good i need you and i choose to live in relationship with you forever and forever now that relationship is no longer possible they're completely cut off they're completely in sin there's nothing that they can do in order to be approved by god So as a result, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden to suffer the consequences of their choice. But God took one other step as he cast out Adam and Eve out of the garden. So let me read verse 24 for me, please. Byron, you read it, because you were reading earlier. After he drove the man that was placed on the east side of the garden of the material, flashing back and forth to guard the way the tree of life. So how did God ensure that Adam and Eve would never get back into the garden? What did God do? He put a flaming sword, just a flaming sword? And also a what? An angel, a, ch- a, chair, a cherubim. This was one of God's most powerful angels who was as a flame of fire, able to move like a flash of lightning in every direction. And all it took was one of them to guard the way back in. And so here you go. How, how, how scary would that have been as that stood at the entrance back into the Garden of Eden? Think about that. So, but why would God cast them out of the Garden of Eden? Hadn't he just promised them a deliverer that was gonna come to set them free? So why in the world is he being so harsh? Like, why is he kicking them out? Didn't he just promise them a deliverer was going to come to set them free? To crush Satan's head? So why cast them out? What's the problem here? Is God being vindictive here? Yeah, and they had, to wait out, they had to wait outside of the garden in their mess until that deliverer would come to bring them back in. But there's also the other aspect of his character. God had to follow through with his character. He said, you're cut off from me. And to be in that garden portrayed an intimacy of relationship because that's where he walked and talked with him in the garden. And God had to portray to them, you're cut off from me. You're outside of my provision. You're now, you're now gonna live in that sin-cursed mess that came about as a result of your own sin. So as Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, what did they get in exchange? As they were kicked out of the garden, what did they get in exchange? What did they, what did they have and what did they gain? They replaced life with God for what? What did they replace life with God with? They had life with God, now they've got separation and death. What else did they have? And now what do they have? What do they gain? What do they have now, what do, they, what do they have? What do they, what do they get? So in the garden, they had perfect provision. Now they, have, they replaced that with constant need. What else do they have and what do they give up? Yeah, so they had perfect, they had perfect environment and they gave that up and they gave that up for, for a broken, sin-cursed, thorns and thistles. What else do they have? And what, else, what do they have? And what, they, what do they get? Didn't they, didn't they replace godly protection with, for fear under Satan? Didn't they replace a perfection with a sin-cursed, broken world? They replaced a perfect relationship to, uh, to dysfunction, didn't they? Because their relationship with each other was perfect. Now there was dysfunction. Amazing. God had provided them with so much, yet they threw it all back in their face. And what did they get in return? What did they get in return? They lost horribly, didn't they? So let's think a little bit further about Adam and Eve being locked out of the garden. Could they bribe the chairman to be allowed to get back in? They come up to the chairman. Okay, so let's give, some, let's give the chairman some money or some food. Hey, can I bribe them to get back in? Is that a possibility for them? No, because does the chairman need anything? 
No, absolutely not. So could they, could they beat up the chairman or could they shoot him to regain access into the garden? No, because what is this? And who is Adam in relation? He's nothing in comparison because of, of the sheer power of, of this creative being. Could they call on their father, Satan, to help them regain access? Hey, Satan, come help me. Would Satan come to re-help them to get access back into the garden? Is Satan there as their helper? Satan is there to do what? To destroy them. He's not out there to help them. So would the cherubim allow Adam and Eve back into the garden if they worshipped them and they prayed to them? Oh, those cherubim of cherubim. Would, would he allow them back access into the garden based on that? Absolutely not. The angels are on the authority of God. They sinned against God and therefore God alone could allow them back into the garden. So what about God? Could Adam and Eve bribe God with some money and some food and some promises? Hey, God will never do it again. Will you let us back in? Will God allow them back in if they made some promises and, and, uh, and uh, bribed him? No way. Accepting a bribe would be against his character and you already judged them. What if Adam and Eve cried and had a temper tantrum and they pleaded for mercy? Surely God would forgive, allow them in, wouldn't he? Would that have been sufficient? No way God is faithful to his word and his character. They've been cast out of the garden, cut off from God, and under his wrath and his curse, this is how bad sinners really are before a holy God. Completely, completely cut off. No hope and no access back in by our own merit. So let's pause to consider what it means for us today that that God is faithful to his word and casting all sinners out of his presence to suffer the consequence for their choice. So here's a question. Shaden, where were you born? Were you born in the garden or out of the garden? So, John, were you born in the garden or out of the garden? Yeah, every, yeah there's two Johns here. Yeah, were, were, were we, all of us, were we born in the garden or out of the garden? Outside, outside of the garden. So guess what? So here's another question. Where were all of our religious leaders, all of our scientists, all of our friends, all of the media, every man, woman, and child, were they born in the garden or outside of the garden? Outside of the garden. So seeing as all of us are born outside the garden, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us today? We're all separated. What else does that mean? Yeah, we're content with the same punishment Adam and Eve is. What else does it mean? We're banished from the garden and we're cut off from God. And that's what it represents. We're born outside of the garden, cut off. What else does that mean? Is, sorry, there's nothing we can do to change it. Is there any man, woman, or child, religion, or scientist that can help us get back in the garden? No, because where are they? They're outside stuck, outside of the garden with us as well. They're not God and not able to take us back in. We too have to suffer outside of the garden until the coming deliverer comes to set us free and make the way open for us to get back in the garden. God is faithful to his word and casting all sinners out of his presence to suffer the results of their choice. Number two, God will accept us if we come by the one way that he provides, repentance and faith. So take your Bibles and turn back with me to Genesis chapter four, verses one and two. Genesis chapter four, verses one and two. Can somebody read that please? Now Adam knew he and his wife, and she was sleeping for Cain, saying, I have caught in a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. Okay, so here we have Cain and Abel. Were they born inside the garden or outside? They were born outside of the garden, cut off from God, just like their father Abraham, our father Abraham, father Adam, bound by Satan, their sin, and destined for the lake of fire. And so now you see Cain and Abel's name up there on the timeline there, as we've written it out there. So at what point did they receive their personal sin debt with God? At what point did Adam and Eve receive their personal sin debt with God? As soon as they were born? It's at conception, the moment they were conceived, they were cut off from God, born in Adam. So here's their sin deaths, both of them with one knot in them because of their sin in Adam that had been passed down to them. Their names are now as well on this debt list as well with, with Adam and Eve. So here we have Cain and we have Abel. 
So their names, whose names are listed, will pay for their sin debt in Adam by being forever separated from God in the, in, the lake, in the lake of fire. They too are cut off from God, cut off because of his offspring, offspring of Adam. So notice how they respond in their desperate need. Verses three to five. Somebody read that for me, please, with a loud voice. These are huge verses. So it came about the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the truth of the ground. Abel and his part also brought the first tents of the flock and their fat portions. The Lord had reserved for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering had no reserve. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Okay, so here we so what is the so what are the, the differences between the two offerings? What are the differences between the two offerings? So one brought, one brought a blood, one brought a blood sacrifice, sheep. What did the other one bring? What did Cain bring? Fruit, didn't he? Okay. So so what was God's response to two sacrifices? Actually, I need to get a, a one more picture here. So what was, God's, what was God's response to the two offerings? What should he accept? Sorry? He accepted, he accepted Abel's, didn't he? And he but he rejected, he rejected Cain's. What was Cain's response? He, he, was, he was angry. So let's go on to figure out, see why God accepted Abel's. Let's go to chapter, let's go to verse 6, to the first part of 7. Now it's important that we understand the context to get the sense as to what's being stated here. Verse 6 to the first part of seven, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? So here we have it. Notice how God said to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? This means that God told them what to offer in order to be accepted, i.e. a lamb. But Cain refused, deciding to come his own way. We also know that God told them what to bring because think about it, Abel's every thought, word and deed was completely tainted with sin. Could God accept Abel based on anything that he thought up? Absolutely not. And so Abel's acceptance is only based in him coming God's way in God's means and how he laid it out. Secondly, only a holy God is able to declare how to come to meet his holy demands. And then thirdly, we also notice, we also know that God told them what to bring because God judges based on what he's declared. For instance, in the Garden of Eden, God told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you do, you will die. So now here, God is is accepting and rejecting based on what he declared. It lines up with his character. See, this is huge. Think about the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin and the judgment of God. Here is a sinful man in Adam coming to a holy God and being accepted. Think about it. Here's here's Abel cut off from God, coming to a holy God. And what was God's response? What was God's response? He accepted it. He accepted Abel. So how is this possible? Here's 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 Abel's sin debt. How is this possible that God could accept an, a sinner born in Adam, cut off from him, and accept him? Well, how is that possible? Abel could have only come in the one way that God declared, and that is repentance and, and repentance and faith. And what's more startling is that God desired to accept him if he would come in the one way that God laid out. Think about that. So here's God's wrath and his indignation poured out on sin against him. But on the other hand, he's reaching out, desiring to accept. And you see that almost pleading with Cain. Cain, if you do what is right, you too will be accepted. There's a, there's a pleading, a desiring that he would come in this way that God provided. So remember, remember that Adam and Eve, they died, were separated from God for an eternity as a payment for their sin. They could never make this payment in order to be accepted by God. And to be accepted by God, they had to be as holy as he is. In other words, all of these charges, every last one of these, had to be wiped out in order for them to be accepted by God. They're cut off. Then God in his grace provided an acceptable, an acceptable covering for Adam and Eve. 
This was his idea from start to finish. It required a death, the death of a substitute, in order to provide a suitable covering for for them to be acceptable by God. And through that, he was portraying that if they too would come by way of repentance and faith, then they too would be accepted by God. If they would come in this manner, acknowledging the absolute holiness of God that demands us to be equally holy, if they would admit to their, that their sin was against God in a helpless and hopeless condition, if they would reject, reject all means outside of themselves, to, um, outside of God to make them holy, and then trust only in the coming deliverer, then God said he too would accept them, providing that temporary covering for their sin. Now back to Cain and Abel. As what God asked of them flows out of these foundational truths, God required that they would offer a substitute lamb on their behalf. Hebrews 9.22 says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness of sins. In this light, take your Bibles and turn to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. We need to understand why God would accept Abel's offering and reject reject um, Cain's. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Okay, somebody read that with a loud voice, please. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Okay, so why did God tell Cain and Abel to spill the blood of a lamb in order to be accepted by God? Why did God tell Cain and Abel to spill the blood of a lamb in order to be accepted by God. The blood makes atonement. And what's atonement? Atonement is a covering, a covering in order for God to be, to, to God, for God to be able to accept that covering. So for the life of the creature is where? Is in the blood. And it's been given to you to make atonement for yourselves in the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for, one, for one's life. It's the life of the substitute lamb was given in exchange for their deaths. The blood of the lamb temporarily covered their sin until such time as the deliverer would come to make that ultimate payment to take take care of their sin. Notice how Cain's offering was rejected because there was no shed blood on behalf of his sin. Forgiveness isn't free. The payment for sin is death. And so it's the the life is in the blood. And so as that blood is spilled, so too is, is signifying that death. Let me try to illustrate the importance of a blood sacrifice. If I killed somebody and was sentenced to death, and that's not in Canada anymore, but when, the, when capital punishment was still in place, if I killed somebody and uh, I was sentenced to death, could I get off if I paid the court a million dollars? No, because the court said the payment was death, a life for a life, as it were. So forgiveness isn't free. What would be my only hope? If I was sentenced to die, what is my only hope? Somebody, a substitute would have to step into my place to die in my place. Likewise for Cain and Abel, sin against God. God charged them with death. Therefore, only the spilling of lifeblood could make that payment, life for a life. Abel portrayed this when he killed a substitute lamb in place of himself. The animal's blood couldn't pay for the sin, but rather it provided a temporary covering until such time as the deliverer would come to make that ultimate payment. So why couldn't the blood of an animal pay for Abel's sin? Why was the blood of the animal, it was a substitute, but it was just sufficient to provide a covering? Why wasn't Abel like a person who stood in my place to die in my place if I was guilty? Why is an animal only just a covering and not a full substitute? Why is that? Yeah, the animal is not created in the image and the likeness of God, and so therefore it couldn't fully be a substitute for mankind. Only God's deliverer, who would be, what? Would be born of a woman who could come as a sufficient substitute to take our place. On the other hand, Cain tried to pay for a sin in his own way and was rejected, i.e. there was no shed blood of a substitute. And so we need to understand that, that significance. So looking at these charts on humility and pride, which one symbols Cain? Pride does, doesn't it? Which one symbolizes Abel? 
humility, doesn't it? So look at, let's, let's look at Cain's attitude and notice the significance of why God accepted the one and rejected the other. So Cain said, God, you're not good. I don't need you. God, I'm able to overthrow the one who created me and take his place. I exist by my own strength and wisdom. No one will rule over me or tell me what to do. I alone have the final say over everything in my life. I am good. There is no sin in me. He's rejecting it and saying, hey, there's no big deal. Vegetables are sufficient. Whereas Abel, on the other hand, said, Lord God, you are good, loving, and gracious. All I need is found in you. Lord God, I belong to you alone as my sole owner and final ruler. Lord God, I belong to you continuously. I I need you to continuously lead me and teach me. Lord God, I exist for you alone. Lord God, I am a sinner against you and completely unable to help myself. Just that humility before him. But let's look at how repentance and faith fits together. So let me grab a coin here, a toonie here. So I have a toonie here. Which side of the coin is more important? Which side of the coin is of more value? Neither. Both, are, both, are, both have to be there, don't they? If, if both weren't, sides weren't there, would the coin have any value? Absolutely no. Both have to be there to, to give the value. Likewise for repentance and faith. They're two sides of the same coin. If we come as a person truly acknowledges the absolute holiness of God and our helpless and hopeless condition then the flip side naturally will follow through where we're going to come before God and say, God, I need you. God, I need your help. I need your deliver. It's the same two sides of the same coin. So let me try to illustrate further what this trust in God really is that Abel portrayed. When we go to the hospital for surgery and lie down on the gurney, we've already researched the surgeon. Okay, which surgeon is best? We've already done our homework. And then as we lie down on the, on the gurney, we're recognizing and acknowledging we can do nothing to help ourselves and we release ourselves completely into the hands of the surgeon, don't we? Then in the middle of the surgery, does a, does a surgeon ask us to give him a hand? What a stinking mess that would be, wouldn't it? So too for Abel. He put his complete faith in God's provision outside of himself. He released himself completely into the, ha- the care of the one true deliverer that God would send to help him. He just completely acknowledged who God was, his own inability to help himself, and he released himself into the care of the one who God was going to send to provide a way. Bring this into our world today. Does God still desire to accept us if we come by the one way that he provides, repentance and faith? Does he still desire? Notice that God will accept. Does he still desire to accept us today if we'll come in his one way? Or was this just for Abel? No, it wasn't just for Abel because we noticed from God's word, God was pleading with Cain. Cain, if you do what is right, you too will be accepted. God desired to accept Cain as much as Abel and that way is made open. So is this offer good for even the worst of sinners to come by way of repentance and faith? Even the worst of sinners, is is this still way open? Repentance and faith sufficient for them too? Because before God, is there any worse than another? How badly, how much more corrupted can each of us be in sin? We're completely set apart, aren't we? And so how do we know this? How do we know, how do we know that God desires to accept us if we come by way of repentance and faith? How do we know? Can we know? How do we know? He wrote it down in his word. How else can we know? How else can we know that God will accept us if we come in repentance and faith? How else can we know? Huge truth. Huge truth. Yeah? He can't, go, he can't go against his own character, but one step, one step further, think about it. Who's able? Who's able in relation to us? Who is able in relation to every one of us sitting here tonight? He's our cousin, isn't he? Did God accept Abel that way? Did God accept my cousin in, by repentance and faith? Does his word declare that he accepted Abel in that way? And if it's good enough for my cousin Abel, is it good enough for me as well? Absolutely, because we come from the same family. We've got the same blood. And if it's good enough for Abel, it's good enough for me today because God cannot lie. He is completely, completely holy. Can you think of any beliefs that contradict 
that contradict um, um, what God teaches about repentance and faith to be accepted by him? Can you, can you think of any, any beliefs that contradict um, what God declares about repentance and faith? So here's, here's one, just to kind of prime the pump. I don't know if you can read it underneath down there. I have to really, really believe. So how do, if I, so God's going to accept me if I really, really, really believe. Does that line up with what God has declared here? Why does that, why does that not line up? How much do you have to believe? Who am I resting in? Who am I putting my faith in? Me and what I can do. I'm not resting in what he's providing. What are some other things that are contrary to what God declares about repentance and faith as as he's declared? I haven't done anything really big and bad. Basically, what's, it, what's, it, what's that statement saying about what God is declaring here? I haven't done anything really bad. How does that contradict the truth that we've just seen from God's word? Okay, I don't deserve what he said. Yeah, I'm not that bad. I don't really need that. I got my own way back in. Thank you very much. I don't need your help. I can do it all by my elf. Okay, what other, what other ways? What other ways? Okay, um, how about this one? have to believe in the right way. You have to say the right prayer. You have to go forward in the right way. You have to bow in a certain manner. How does that line up with the truth of God's word of repentance and faith? Does it line up? Because again, what am I resting in? Our own, our own abilities. Can we think of any others? Yeah, the good cancels out the bad. Okay. And again, that's basically saying that what God is saying is, is, is not true. Um, how about this one? I have to promise to never sin again. Okay? So if, if in order for God to accept me, yeah, repentance and faith, yeah, that's right, but I have to promise along with that that I'll never sin again because otherwise that's going to negate everything, right? How does that line up with the truth? we have to set ourselves and release ourselves completely into the care into the care of another i don't know can you think of any others i have to try really really hard not to do bad things see all of these basically who are the, who are we resting in our own selves aren't we and really if we rest in our own selves that would be like me sitting on a three-legged or on a, on a on a broken stool right why are we like a broken stool that we're going to fall over and break, our, break our, 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 sheer, our foolish heads or whatever if we sit on it. Why are we like that broken stool? Can we rest in ourselves? We're all outside the garden. And what does God say about us? Is there any goodness in us? Is there anything that we can do? We're all as filthy rags. The, the best that I can hold up is merely filthy, filthy rags. Let's, just, let's destroy these. Let's rest only Let's rest only on what God has provided, what he's promising through the deliverer outside of ourselves. God will accept us if we come by the one way that he provides, repentance and faith. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Number three, God graciously calls sinners to repentance and faith, desiring to rescue, but he allows us to make that choice. Let's go, take, go back to Genesis chapter four. Genesis chapter four, verse five. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his, and, his face, and his face fell. So did Cain have the right to get angry with God for rejecting his offering? Did Cain have the right to get, ang- did Cain have the right to get angry with God for rejecting his offering? Why not? He was told, he was clearly declared, Cain, come in this one way. 
And so we see that through the context. Cain, if you do what is right, you too will be accepted. What did Cain's anger at God reveal about himself? What did Cain's anger at God reveal about himself? Yeah, who is truly following? Because is he admitting, is he admitting to his sin? Is he admitting to his sin? Or is that one? Is he re- he's relying on his own abilities here too, but he's not admitting to his sin either. So who is he following? He's following his father, Satan, isn't he? Why else? What else does, it, what else does his, his anger reveal about Cain? Sorry, he's full of pride. Yeah, I can do it all by myself. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good myself. He refused to admit that his best was not good enough. He refused to admit how broken and how badly in sin he was before a holy and a righteous God. He refused to give a blood sacrifice, a life for a life. Amazing, God has been so merciful and gracious to Cain in so many ways, but yet he defies God. Does he have a death wish? Like really think about that. He's standing and talking to who? Who's talking to him? Almighty God is pleading with his creative being, the one who is incredible, above incredible, is talking to him. Look at verse six and seven. Notice what goes on here, this dialogue. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And what has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you, do, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. His desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So does God strike down Cain for his continued defiance? Does he just, boom, done. Does he strike him down? No, he tries to help him, doesn't he? He reaches out to him. He extends still more mercy, giving him what he doesn't deserve. He deserves instant death and the instant lake of fire, but God doesn't do that. How was God also gracious to Cain? How was he also gracious to Cain here in this, in this particular verses, giving him what he doesn't deserve? What does he do? Verse seven, what does, he, what does God say? What does God declare to him? Yes, but it, but it goes one step further. So there's that sense of grace and mercy that goes one step further. The last part of verse seven, and if you do not do well, what's crouching at your door? Sin is crouching your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So what is God doing? He's declaring to him where his defiance is going to lead him, choosing to draw him back. So what was God's desire for Cain? What was his desire? To repent and come to him. God wanted to draw him into his embrace. Did you sense the, 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 the longing, the desire? Cain, come. This is where life is. I created you for intimacy, real intimate relationship. This is where it is. Come. This is the one way. This is where it's open. Cain, choose life. So did God demand or force Cain to come his way? Did God have a great big stick over Cain's head? And Cain, you better or else. Is that what's happening in these verses? God is lovingly pleading. God's grace is unmerited, boundless favor. It originates solely within God. We contribute nothing nor want nothing in return. Grace is one-way love. God and his grace is seeking to draw. So let's just, let's just remind ourselves here very quickly of some of these, of some of these truths here as we've, been, as we've been looking at them here. So think about that. So as God created, how was God gracious to Adam in his creation? How was God gracious to Adam in his creation? We have more light so we can actually kind of go back and add to that what we knew before. How was he gracious to Adam in his creation? Based on what we now know. Can you see the connection? How was he gracious to Adam? He told Adam the consequences of rebellion against him. Okay, but we're at, his, we're, at his crea- we're at his creation yet, just in his creating. Think about that. Did God knew in his creation what Adam was going to do? Did God still go ahead and create Adam? He still chose to, didn't he? He still chose to create, create him in his image. So then think about, okay, in the, well, in the garden, okay? So Andrew already asked, how was God gracious to Adam in the garden? He warned them, he warned them of what would be there, the consequences should he defy God, didn't he? So then even one step further, how did God show grace to Adam and Eve after they sinned? How did he show grace to them? He provided a covering for them. How else, did he, how else did he show grace? To the most undeserving sinners of all time who just slapped them in the face. How was God gracious to Adam and Eve in their sin? 
promised a redemption, promised them a deliverer who would come from God. The one who is offended would step down to, to bribe that means. So in spite of Cain's experience, experiencing God's grace and God's warning, listen to what happens next in verses eight and nine. In verse eight and nine. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So here we have, so where did Cain's defiance, where did Cain's defiance lead him? Where did his defiance lead him? To murder his, to murder his brother, didn't he? We find the picture here. So amazing how all that God had warned Adam and Eve and Cain about was now coming true. So look at Cain's actions through this chart. So how does this chart portray his actions? How is this a fulfillment? How is this picture a fulfillment of who he is in Adam? What's the connection? Is there a connection? What's the connection? Everything. He's cut off from God, right? And he's what? He's controlled by what? Controlled by sin, isn't he? Who's he relying on? He's himself, because God had just told him, hey, Cain, watch out. Sin's crouching at your door. It wants to get you. Is Cain listening? No. He's, how, what's, what's he controlled by? Shame, isn't he? He's just been, shame, he's just been shamed by God because he wouldn't accept him. He's controlled by pride. We've said that. He's, who is the, he's the enemy as who is? Satan is. He's controlled by King Satan is who seeks to destroy him. He has a sin death. And look at all, look at the truth. He followed through with every one of those things in separation from God. And yet, how did God respond to Cain even after we killed Abel? How did he respond? Gave him an opportunity to repent, didn't he? Further, further opportunity, further evidence of his grace. Think about this theme as it relates to us. Why is God calling us to repentance and faith? Why is God calling us to repentance and faith? Yeah, he does not want the death of one sinner. He desires to rescue. He calls all sinners. He desiring to, desiring to, desiring to rescue. This is how wretched we are in our sin towards, towards God, but still shows unmerited, boundless favor that originates solely within himself. We contribute nothing nor anything in return. He is still offering his one way of escape, isn't he, to the worst of sinners. He still sustains, he still gives us life and sustains it, doesn't he? And he's provided his love letter to us to declare that he longs to redeem us. He longs to rescue us. So how is, this, how is it possible that the, one has been, that the one that we've offended still desires to rescue? How is it possible that the one who's been so badly offended still desires to rescue how is it possible? Why would he still want to rescue? Do we deserve it? So why would he want to do it? Yeah, indescribable love. Just leave it awestruck. God knew what Cain was going to, God knew that Cain was going to kill Abel, so why didn't he stop Cain? I thought he accepted Abel. I thought Abel was accepted. Why in the world would God not step in to prevent this death, this murder? Why wouldn't God step in? Free will. God has given, God has given a choice, isn't he? He allows us a choice. For him to violate our free will would mean that we are robots without a choice. And that would violate the freedom of love. It's all or nothing. Let's go back here. There's only one problem. It's one thing to hear about the solution, and it's another to act on it. Let me illustrate. When a pilot puts his plane on autopilot, the computer completely takes over, allowing the pilot to sleep if he wants. The computer will not divert. So being born in Adam, what is our built-in autopilot? Is it one, is autopilot built towards humility or pride? What's our autopilot in Adam? Is it built towards pride or humility? It's a pride, isn't it? In every thought, every attitude, every desire, every word and deed, pride will lead us to deny the charges against us or will seek to find our own solution to our problem. 
But thankfully, God created us in his image with a will that we have, the, we have the decision, we have the ability to switch over and switch off the autopilot pride that's going to lead us to our destruction. We can choose to humble ourselves and we can choose to humble ourselves and, um, and follow through. These are still the steps that God has given today. Repentance and faith is still open to every, every last one of us today. And the choice is ours to switch off the autopilot of pride and say, God, you are holy. God, I'm helplessly, hopelessly lost. God, I'm rejecting all means outside of you to make me holy. God, I'm putting my trust in the provision that you're going to provide. We must be careful, we must be careful thinking that we can postpone this decision because our autopilot and Adam is set to track with Cain. Only decision to humble ourselves will turn off the autopilot, but don't delay. Because the truth is, God graciously calls sinners to repentance and faith, desiring to rescue, but he, but he allows us the choice. There's no stick over our head. In conclusion, I trust that you see um, our God's heart in all of this. And on the one hand, he's angry, angry at Adam Eve's choice. But on the other hand, his love and his grace pleading and desiring to rescue. He didn't have to provide a rescue plan, but he did. And it's on his terms as the offended party, not ours. Our choice got us into this mess. And our choice can get us out of it if we choose to humble ourselves in repentance and faith. But we need to understand that God is faithful to his word in casting all sinners out of his presence to suffer the results of their choice. God will accept us if we come by the one way that he provides, repentance and faith. God graciously calls sinners to repentance and faith, desiring to rescue, but he allows you to choose.